RoboCop, the series, a behind-the-scenes sneak preview. years now since the uh, original storyline basically we're beginning at least five years after that so what's happened now is that Murphy and Robocop have perfected the police part of themselves and this is the first time that uh, Robocop begins to experience motion now, nobody moves or she gets it we've gone back to the original movie and tried to enhance and probably deliver more humor more satire as well as a stronger humanity for the people around Robo. I'm worried about my son, Jimmy. I yelled at him about his grade. Death, Death do us part. What's the matter? I have to go somewhere there is a crime happening. One thing that we really liked about the uh, Robocop one uh, was it had a, a fabulous tongue-in-cheek humor. We went after the first original writers, Ed Newmeyer, Michael Miner. I mean, who, who better than to get the original guys who created RoboCop? All right, here's the situation. You called me. It's bad. I am Robo's best friend and partner. We're gonna, um, kick some butt. Actually, Robo does it, but I like to think I had something to do with it. <laughs> Charlie? Uh, yeah. He's, um... Is he dead? Yeah. The way the suits are talking, he might as well be. I was able to preserve his organics, but it'll cost a fortune to bring him back online. And according to the guy on the right, OCP's not paying. The problem is always that she's a woman. <laughs> but, uh, Lisa's one of those people that just, you know, Relentless. She's going to get where she wants to be, and really soon. I'm Robocop's nemesis. Take a good look at this face. You did this to me. Every time I sneeze, I think of you. I seek revenge in a, a rather a Joker-like style. One officer dead, one wounded. And inside, William Ray Puttface Morgan, the violent psychopath who recently escaped from the Henry Ford Center for the Morally Challenged. He's currently holding... A group of helpless retired people hostage. Don't jerk me around, cop! Do what I tell you, or I'll get mad and do something really ugly! Of course, uh, this time it doesn't work out too well for me, but uh, I, I come back at him about three more times in this film, so... <laughs> and what I want is to give you an opportunity to go down in history as the man who killed Robocop. 40 millimeter, armor-piercing, Cobra assault cannon. Nice. State of the art, Puttface. May I call you Puttface? Sure thing, poodle boy. It's going to not only complement the, the first film in many ways, um, it is the uh, matrix for setting up this particular film, and um, it's going to include all of the wonderful things that the first film had. Uh, and at the same time, it's going to have a more uh, up-to-date version of now, of what's happening right now in terms of how we're dealing with, with crime and uh, uh, how we feel about things politically and so forth. So it's, it's a wonderful character. It's a super character in the sense that uh, um, it's the new Superman in, in, in a way that I think that everybody wants to see it. Robocop is back in big, mean-talking version and interceptor-driving action model. Always ready to fight crime and rebuild to fight another day from the world of Robocop. In the original uh, feature, Robocop had uh, three directives. Uh, uphold the law, protect the innocent, and serve the public trust. Uh, and we felt that uh, uh, at any one time, 
RoboCop could have a fourth directive. We see RoboCop confront situations. We see in RoboVision these alternatives presented, and we see the alternatives he selects, whether it's pain compliance or whether it's a disabling uh, move or the use of deadly force. And it'll happen in the very first scene uh, of the film when we have our, our action scene with, a, with, a, with, a, with one of the criminals, Pudface. And we'll continue. That will be the awakening, meaning that that's the first time that this aggressive emotional behavior, Murphy will come through. He'll want to fight past the directives. He'll want to get past this program. He wants to get Pudface. That's the Dirty Harry part. Take care of it. Get it done. Because as Dirty Harry, or in this case, Dirty Murphy, he doesn't believe that a criminal has the same rights that a victim has. It's getting pretty hairy out there, Sarge. I call for backup. And just what does that mean? It means backup. Well, he got hurt bad from the outset. That's how he became RoboCop. I mean, he got blown away. And if you recall from the first movie, I mean, there was very little left of the man. And so uh, he harbors a lot of that inside. And uh, it dictates a lot of what he does today. That is to say, he doesn't think that he would be uh, capable of taking care of his family, for example, because he thinks he'd be a danger to them. You were thinking about him again, weren't you? Images are all that's left of what I was. I want to remember. Um, and it's hard being a machine when you were once a complete human being, because there's so many things you can't do as a machine but that you relate to, or still relate to, as a human being. So it's quite a dilemma for him. Sort of the man and the machine, or the machine and the man. This is all you could get on the late Murphy Alex J? That's it. According to OCP specs, his brain was used to run the autonomic system, but the man's memory was wiped clean. Overall, this would just be a gas, because, I mean, just the special effects and all that great stuff. Can't wait to see the outcome, you know? ritual involved in it and uh, I like it that way I guess I'm a little bit of a ritualistic actor I mean there's a sense of coming online and uh, so you feel awkward when people are watching you getting dressed because you feel kind of naked there is it's there's a there's a sense of quiet there's piece by piece you know we get dressed into the suit and it's buckled in and so forth and as it goes in you know the uh, the feeling starts happening and I start getting involved in it sometimes I feel like uh, I guess what uh, perhaps a fo professional football player might feel like at that Super Bowl, you know, it's that couple of minutes, you know, and the adrenaline starts to pump. And what happens is that from this particular fiberglass sort of outfit, I begin to breathe life into it, it into me. Yeah, and all of a sudden there's a uh, a moment where you say, "Okay, I'm ready," and your time it's time to to get on your chariot, you know, and go out there and and do battle. Fight crime with a strong economy. And these... Crazy cars! Be a superhero! Be a super shopper! The OCP Supercard. No annual membership fee and still at the low, low 38% annual interest rate. The um, satire is a little sharper and there is still some great violence but I'll probably a little less of it, only because in the era we live in, I think it's better to have humor and violence than continual violence. And the idea is to have inventive, unique violence, not just the straight blood and guts and gore kind of stuff. So I think that's the, the, uh, the prime directive, as they say. We have a fairly extensive action sequence at the end of the film where he comes across a barricade that's been built by a group called the Dogtown Boys. During this sequence, we have uh, kids on rollerblades, motorcycles jumping over the barricades, all sorts of explosive action. They're going to have adrenaline rush. A roller coaster ride. I hope they cheer, stand up, get, get powerful, want to scream, want to yell, say, yes! It's RoboCop. He's coming your way. RoboCop is here. Thank you for watching.